The second type of nonlinear inequality that we're going to look at are polynomial inequalities. Um, and so in example five, it says that we want to solve x squared plus 7x is less than or equal to negative 12. Okay, and then put the solution in interval notation. So um, what I'm actually going to do is usually I don't start problems this way. We usually explore it a little more. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us the steps to solving one of these. And then we're going to backtrack and understand why these steps make sense. All right, so first we're going to move all terms to one side. So in the, in the case of this one here, that would mean let's maybe get the 12 over to the left. So it'll be x squared plus 7x plus 12 is less than or equal to 0. Okay. Then number 2 says factor the non-zero side of the inequality. Okay. So let's see if this factors. Uh, the answer is yes. It factors into x plus 3 times x plus 4. Okay, now it asks us to determine the values that make each factor zero and list the intervals that these points divide the number line into. Okay, so what's that all about? Here we're gonna need more room for number three. So what they're suggesting we do is first of all note that x equals negative three and x equals negative four are zeros. And then what they mean by uh, list the intervals that you divide the number line into is take the zeros and first of all write them in order. So I'm going to put negative 4 first and negative 3 second because that's the proper order. Um, and then divide the number line. Okay, well what do we mean by that? So I like to just put a nice solid vertical line um, here and here, okay? Um, I'm not always going to make the line solid. I'll explain that um, in a later example. But for now, we're just going to put these vertical lines, okay? Number four says, plug in a test point from each interval determined in step three in for the variable to determine the sign of the inequality over that interval. Okay, so they want us to plug a number into here. So like, let's, let's take negative five, for example. So if I put negative five in for x, that's to the left of negative four. If I did that, that's gonna give me negative two times negative one, which is gonna give me positive two. Now, I don't really care very much about the number itself. What I care about is that it is positive. Okay, so let's do the same thing in the middle here. So the middle, how about negative 3.5, right? So that would be between negative 4 and negative 3. So negative 3.5 plus 3 and negative 3.5 plus 4. So that's going to give me negative 0 0.5 times positive 0 0.5, which is negative 0.25. But like, like in the last one, I don't really care what the number is. What I care about is that it's negative. Okay, positive, negative. And let's do the same thing over here. I always like plugging in zero whenever I can. So zero is to the right of negative three because that's just makes life easier. So that gives me a positive 12, but it's positive. Okay, so that was step number four. Okay, and then it says use that the information attained in the previous step to write the solution in a set as a union of intervals. Okay, so let's now go back to the original, right? So the original, well, I, I guess the not the original, but from step one, when we moved all the terms to one side, what are we saying? We're saying that this, the expression, should be less than or equal to zero. In other words, it should be negative. So because we want negatives, we're going to choose this interval here. And because I have a, an equal sign under that inequality, I'm going to put brackets. And so my answer is going to be negative 4 to negative 3. Okay. Now, here's the thing. What does require a little bit of explanation is why is it that we can just plug in a single test point and then be sure that 
we know what's happening throughout the whole interval. So when I put this plus here, I'm saying it's plus from negative 4 all the way to the left. It's negative everywhere between negative 4 and negative 3, and then from negative 3 on. Okay. The reason for that is with polynomials, let's just pull up a cal uh, our calculator here, with polynomials, the only way to switch from being positive to negative is to cross a zero. So here's the one that we were just looking at. Oops, let's go back to zoom standard. Okay, here's the one we were just looking at. Okay, and you can see it real nicely here. Here's negative four, here's negative three. The only time this dips below zero is between negative four and negative three. So with polynomials, even if it's not a quadratic, even if it's bigger than that, the only way you switch from positive to negative is by crossing a zero. So that's why it's sufficient just to find your zeros, figure out from a test point whether it's positive or negative, and then you'll know what the sign is everywhere in that interval, not just at that particular test point. All right, so let's try a couple others here. So here's one where they've got it all factored for us already, um, and they're saying this is greater than or equal to zero. So pretty easy to list these out. x equals zero, x equals five, x equals negative three are the zeros for this. Now we put it in order. So negative three, zero, five, Okay. Put nice solid lines here, and then we're just going to go through and do the test point thing uh, that we did um, in the previous one. So something just a little bit to the left of negative 4, so that would be, or negative 3, excuse me, would be the number negative 4. So I'll plug that in for x. So negative 4 times negative 9 times negative 1. It's negative 36, but the only thing that really matters is that it's negative. So everywhere to the left of negative 3, this is negative. All right, between here, how about let's choose negative 2. So negative 2 going in for each of these. It's going to be negative 2 times negative 7 times positive 1, which gives me 14. So it's positive everywhere in there. All right, between zero and five, how about we pick one? All right, so one times negative four times four, negative 16, so it's negative everywhere in here. And then something to the right of five, so six would work. Six times six minus five, six plus three, 54, but the point is, is it's positive. Okay, so what do we want? Well, going back here, we clearly want when this is greater than or equal to zero. So we want the positives. Those are the ones that we want. So we're going to say that we want negative 3 to 0. I'm using greater than or equal to, so I'm going to put brackets on those. But then I'm going to union that with 5 up to infinity. That's the other place where it's positive. All right. Now, one thing just to be careful of um, as you're looking at um, inequalities is don't just assume that it's always going to alternate. It won't always necessarily alternate. Okay. And I know it did in the last problem and it did in this one, um, but it's not automatic. So. Um, and particularly, the times when you're going to get situations where it doesn't alternate between zeros um, are going to be those times when you have a higher multiplicity, right? So if you come down and just hit the zero and then rebound back up. So, um, you know, don't uh, just be careful of that about making too many assumptions. All right, so let's look at example number five. Um, 
So here, okay, here we don't have step one done yet, right? We did in the last one. We actually had steps one and two done for us already, but in this one we don't. Now, thinking ahead a little bit here, it's actually really useful to make sure you get it in a position where it's easiest for you to factor. I don't know about you, but I always like to factor things where the, where the highest degree term, the x squared term, is positive. So we'll go ahead and say this is 3x squared greater than 13x minus 10. All right, so we'll subtract 13x from both sides. We'll also add 10 to both sides. All right, so we've got it all set up here. All right, can we factor this thing? Let's try it. All right, it would have to be 3x and x. Um, let's see, to make 10, we could either do 2 and 5 or 10 and 1. I'm kind of thinking 10 and 1 is appealing because if I stack a minus 10 here and a minus 1 here, negative 10 minus 3 is negative 13. All right, so I'm able to find the zeros here. So 3x minus 10 equals 0. So we get x is equal to 10 thirds. And then here, of course, x equals 1. All right, so there's our two values. Um, so we'll put 1 first and then 10 thirds. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a dashed line here. Okay, that's different from my previous two examples previous three actually. So I put solid lines, or previous two examples, excuse me. I put solid lines here, okay? Why would I put a dashed line here? Well, because I don't have an equal to sign underneath of this inequality. So to help remind me that in the end, I'm gonna wanna use parentheses instead of brackets, I like to use two different dividing lines. So dashed, if I don't wanna include my zeros, solid if I do want to include my zero. So that's the way that I do it. Um, and so if you like that, um, I would say go for it. I think it's really helpful. I think you'll find it even more helpful when we get to our last type of inequality. All right, but then from there, we got to, you know, just plug in some, um, some values here. So let's take, uh, you know, x equals zero is always my favorite. Three times zero minus 10, and then zero minus one. So that's going to be negative 10 times negative 1 is positive 10. But the point is, is it's positive. All right, and then here, you know, between 1 and 10 thirds, right? What is 10 thirds? 10 thirds is 3 and a third. So how about let's plug in 2, right? That'll work. So we get 6 minus 10 is negative 4 times 1. So it's negative. And then, okay, how about we plug in 4? 3 times 4 minus 10. 4 minus 1. So that's going to be 12 minus 10 is 2. So we get 6, so we get plus here. Okay, so what do we want? Well, we do want positives, right? Greater than 0, right? But those dashed lines remind me, okay, I'm going to grab this, I'm going to grab this, but I'm not going to include 1, and I'm not going to include 10 thirds. So my answer here in interval notation is negative infinity to 1 and union that with 10 thirds up to infinity. All right, now let's uh, connect this back to the concept of domain. Okay, so why might we want to be able to work with nonlinear inequalities? Well, one reason would be let's find the domain of something more complicated like this. Okay. Now, before we dive into the algebra of this inequality, maybe it'd be a good idea just to see if we can sketch a graph of this um, in our calculator. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. The square root of 6 plus x minus x squared. So we graph that. And, you know, I'm looking at this, and 
you know, it looks like a bit of a mess. Uh, you know, it looks like, okay, kind of between negative two and three maybe, but it kind of seems like it stops here. So this is one time where the graph from the graphing calculator doesn't necessarily, you know, give me the answer in a way that I can be really confident about it. So um, let's, let's work the algebra here. So what do we know? We know that we can't take square roots of negatives, right? So when we studied domains before, we always took whatever was inside of the square root and we set it greater than or equal to zero, right? Um, now, uh, looking at this and understanding that we want to um, solve this inequality, um, you know, I'm going to do this. I, I always like it when my x squared term is positive. So this little step I'm going to do here is totally optional, but I'm actually going to move everything over to this side. I could have done the same thing by simply multiplying everything by negative 1, but if I did that, I have to remember to flip that inequality. But I just moved it over, okay? So now I can look at this and maybe more comfortably try to factor it. And I'm thinking x plus 2, x minus 3 is going to do the job. And remember, we kind of thought it, that it looked like that graph was going between negative 2 and 3. So there's my 0 here and my 0 there. So, you know, I can do my sign chart, right? Plug in a negative 3. So I get positive 6. Um, and then we end up with, let's, oh, we can put 0 in. That's always nice. OK. And then uh, let's put in 4. All right, now what do we want? Thinking back to the picture of the graph, it looks like we want the one in the middle. Now don't let this throw you off here. You might say, well, wait a minute, I thought we wanted greater than or equal to zero. Well, we did, but remember, we adjusted the inequality and moved everything to the other side. So what we're actually saying is this expression should be less than or equal to zero. So this expression should be negative. So it actually makes total sense that we'd want to pick this negative that's in the middle, right? And so we would, again, solid line, so I'm going to use brackets. And so this would be the domain of that function. Now, why was the graph playing tricks on us? The reason is, is when things start to get really steep, which they do here, um, what can happen is the, the, the graphing calculator just kind of has trouble finishing it out. So that's why we can't just, you know, rely totally on what our graphing calculator is telling us.